the executive director, Pedro Haro, at the American Lung Association in Hawaii. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you to our Connect Community Connections webinar, The Dangerous Combination of Menthol and Vaping. We have four wonderful speakers today. First, we'll hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Yizuo, who will speak about the research that he has conducted that shows the link between vaping menthol and lung damage. First, uh, and then we will hear from our panel, made up of Sun Choi, Valerie Saiki, and Joshua Cheng, who will speak about some of the initiatives happening locally to combat the youth vaping epidemic in our state. Uh, I'm gonna add a few of the housekeeping measures as well. We will be, as, as Makamai mentioned, we will be recording this webinar for future being. So if you miss any portions, you can view it later. Uh, Dr. Zhu and the panel will have each their own Q&A portion and questions will be taken at the end of each of their talks. If you would like to ask a question, please feel free to enter those questions in the section titled Q&A in the lower section of your Zoom screen. We are happy to use the technology of webinars so that people can attend from all corners of Hawaii and across the nation. However, it also means that many of our viewers will be watching this after the session is over. So please note that this webinar was live on January 10th, 2023. And finally, I'd like to remind everyone that whatever you hear today does not take place of you consulting your medical provider. If you have specific issues that are relevant to your health, please consult your primary care physician. Uh, we wanted to uh, give a quick thank you to our local leadership board, which has supported the work of the Lung Association. These 13 individuals are the reason we are able to do our work here in Hawaii, and we'd like to thank each and every single one of them. Uh, as you mentioned, Aloha Care is our is a sponsor for the American Lung Association series. Uh, in, it was founded in 1994 by Hawaii Community Health Centers. Aloha Care is the third largest health plan in Hawaii, providing health care coverage for Hawaii's Quest, Integration, and Medicare beneficiaries. Thank you to Aloha Care. And finally, today's webinar is being conducted in conjunction with the Hawaii Public Health Institute. Mahalo to Jessica, Makamai, all of the staff at High Five who have helped to make today's webinar possible. For those who are new to our work, let me tell you just a few words about the American Lung Association. Established nationally over 100 years ago, the American Lung Association has been in Hawaii since 1929 and continues to be the trusted champion of lung health. We have four strategic imperatives, which are to defeat lung cancer, champion clean air for all, create a tobacco-free future, and improve the quality of life for those with lung disease and their families. We accomplish these imperatives by engaging in education and advocacy that is rooted in research. You heard me earlier mention the term epidemic when referring to youth vaping rates in the state. In fact, the problem is larger than many even realize. While in 2018, 7% of adults in Hawaii use e-cigarettes and only 2% of adults in Hawaii use smokeless tobacco, nearly a third or 30.6% of high school students in Hawaii use electronic vapor products on at least one day in the past 30 days. That qualifies them as a current e-vape user. If you were to look at youth who had ever tried e-cigarettes in their lifetime, the rate would be closer to 50% of all current high school students in the state. While Hawaii is not one of the worst states in the nation, the amount of youth vaping, uh, the, the amount of youth using vaping products is far too large. The vaping flavor of choice for most youth is, of course, menthol, which can be found in a multitude of products combined with sweet flavors like pineapple orange, lily called passion, and other similar local flavors popular in juices and other youth-friendly products. That is why today's speaker and the research that he has conducted are incredibly important. Dr. Yi Zuo from the University of Hawaii John A. Burns School of Medicine has been conducting research on vaping menthol and the effect it has on lungs. Dr. Zhuo earned his PhD from the University of Toronto. He was a natural sciences and engineering research council postdoctorate fellow in the departments of biochemistry, obstetrics, gynecology at the Western University. He is currently a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and adjunct professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Jabson. Professor Zhuo's research focuses on biomedical engineering using uh, using therapies in environmental sciences and technology related neo uh, nanoparticle and aerosol inhalation. See, I'm even tripping over my own words, Dr. Zuo. That's how smart you are. Please help me welcome Dr. Zuo. Hey, thank Thanks, Fichu, for the introduction. So, and shall I share my screen? Yes. 
Hi, aloha. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, first of all, thank you, uh, Petro, for your introduction. And I want to thank the uh, American Lung Association for inviting me for this, uh, to give me this uh, venture opportunity to, sh to share our research with our local community. And in today's talk, you know, I'm going to talk about like a 40 minutes, and we're going to talk about a dangerous combination of menso and weeping. <clears throat> and first of all, and Petro and Angela, asked me to introduce a little bit about ourselves, you know, and our research uh, at University of Hawaii. And we established a research lab called Laboratory of Bell Colloids and Bell Interfaces. Uh, this is a highly interdisciplinary research lab, you know, and I want to introduce a little bit about the terminology here. So colloid. Colloid probably is not a common word that actually most people know. So this is the chemical terminology to indicate uh, particles. <clears throat> when we talk about colloid, we specifically talk about a particle in the size range between one nanometer to one micron. It's covered a large range of uh, 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 small things <clears throat> from dust, PM 2.5, aerosol, virus, bacteria, so they all fall into this range. So my research in, uh, uh, I established this research lab uh, back to a few years ago when I started my job in University of Hawaii. And specifically, we work on three parts of the research in my lab. You know, my main focus is uh, surface aerodynamics. So as my engineering discipline. So in this part of research, we focus on uh, surfaces or interfaces. By surface or interface, we are actually talking about a region between two immutable phases, which, which is the scientific terminology. As a matter of fact, here, the background of the picture, if you're from Hawaii, you know this is a beautiful Hanauma Bay. So when you look at the surface of the Hanauma, Hanauma, uh, Hanauma Bay, the water surface is actually its interface, is, is our research subject. So the surface of, of water, ocean, is an interface between water and air. So this air-water surface uh, interface, this is the one uh, subject that we study. <laughs> we have developed different methodology. Both, so both software and hardware allow us to do this kind of measurement, characterization in terms of thermodynamics measurements. While we have applications for this part of development, we have two major public applications. One, as just mentioned, that is the particle technology. So yeah. the reason I'm, I'm doing this is because, you know, when you have a glass of water, for the same volume of water, when you break the glass of water into smaller droplets, you can imagine you're going to have a lot of droplets like a billion of droplets, it depends on how small it is. The consequence here is even though you do not change the volume of the glass of water, you do increase the surface area of the water. <clears throat> so therefore, colloid and the surfaces are intimately related. That's the reason why most of technique has been used to study particle technology. For particle, we are talking about either aerosol, uh, Aerosol is airborne particle. When particle go to air, suspending in air, that's called the uh, aerosol. When particle is suspended in liquid, we call it suspension or emotion. And there are different terminology. It's all chemistry. So for this part, actually, we also study biological cell, bacteria, and all of this fall into the size range of colloids. So a different, uh, the different application of our research is biomedic application. For this part of research, we mostly focus on a chemical called a lung surfactant, which is a biological fluid synthesized by type 2 epithelial cell. The main function of this is to stabilize the, the architecture of the lung by reducing surface tension. We're going to talk a lot of, talk about a lot about this in today's talk. And so finally, what I do is I correlate lung surfactant research and the particle research so to generate a new research field is called nano bio interactions. So nano bio interactions is we study when the nano size particle get into your lung, how this is going to affect your health. So one application of this is environmental science. Think about that, you know, the volcano eruption, you know, in few, uh, few uh, days ago. So when the volcano erupts, you know, it, it generates a lot of particle called a walk. So when the walk actually get into your lung, you will probably gonna feel irritation, you cough. And this is actually part of a study that we have been working on environmental science. On the other hand, if you actually were able to load the particle with drug, 
So we actually come up with some kind of new way of deliver a drug to your lung for like to treat asthma, to treat uh, uh, lung diseases. So that's called a pulmonary drug delivery. So that is how, why, and we do this kind of research. <clears throat> um, okay, let me just move on. So this is the outline for this talk. And uh, I'm going to cover several aspects for uh, today's uh, for today's lecture. Um, first part, I'm going to talk about why we study the health impact of weeping. So I'm going to give you a background. First of all, how bad is the situation, and what are the e-cigarettes or weeping products, and why menthol. And second part of this talk, I'm going to focus on. How did we conduct research? Specifically is about lung surfactant and about a smart droplet technique we have developed in my research lab. And then we'll talk about in vitro biophysical simulations of aerosol surfactant interactions. And finally, I'm gonna wrap up with some question that I actually uh, uh, usually asked by the general public is, is weeping safe? Is menthol toxic? and hopefully we are able to draw some conclusions from this talk. <clears throat> First of all, how bad is the situation? <clears throat> well, the situation is very bad, you know, otherwise I won't be invited here to give the talk. So globally, and the global number of adult weepers were estimated to be 82 million in 2021, and the global market of e-cigarettes was estimated to be worth 8 billion in 2015 and expected to expand to more than 80 billion by 2025. Very, very quick expansion. And nationally, the CDC ranks e-cigarettes as the most commonly used nicotine delivery device among US youth uh, with, with minors more likely than adults to use the device. Uh, in terms of states in Hawaii, it is estimated that nearly 30% use in Hawaii have tried e-cigarette, and of which 17% are using e-cigarettes exclusively. And this percentage are significantly higher than the national average. A survey involving six Hawaiian high, school, high schools found that 25% of ninth and 10th grade students have used e-cigarettes at least once, and 18% weeping regularly. A survey by Hawaii State Department of Health estimated that one in three high school students in Maui use e-cigarettes, and the number is quite high. So I first learned those numbers, those statistics, back to five years ago, and also I have seen that uh, there is significant amount of students uh, on campus are waiting. So this is the moment five years ago that I came up with the idea to study uh, the health, potential health impact of, of e-cigarette or waiting. That's what I'm going to report you today. So first of all, what is the e-cigarette or waiting uh, uh, device or product? So electric cigarettes, I'll call e-cigarettes, a waiting product, a battery powered nicotine delivery, nicotine delivery device that produce uh, inhalable aerosols without actual combustion. So if you look at the schematic here, it shows the uh, basic structure of uh, e-cigarette. It starts with a cartridge. The cartridge holds the e-liquid. It, it comes pre-filled or refilled or refillable. It is usually combined with an itemizer as one unit. The itemizer is a coil that generates heat to warm up this liquid to vaporize it into tiny droplets. When the water droplet, oil droplet suspending in air, we call this aerosols. <clears throat> and 
behind this, you know, uh, beneath this atomizer, usually there is a sensor. So that's why you don't see, usually see a, a, a on off button in most e-cigarette uh, device because it has a sensor. Whenever they feel a puff, an uh, inhalation, so the sensor is going to feel that and to power up the itemizer in order to vaporize the liquid in the cart cartridge to generate to generate the aerosol. And the rest of this device usually is a battery. So that is how an e-cigarette works. <clears throat> so e-cigarette actually first appeared in the market in the middle of 2000s. It has went through a several generation of evolution. The first generation of e-cigarette looked like this, like a traditional uh, uh, cigarette made of plastic. So it's a disposable e-cigarette. So when I look at this uh, device, I I don't really remember much. You know, I think some early e-cigarette uh, device does look like this. This is really the worst because not only it produced the e-cigarette vapor, but also generates a lot of plastic waste. So, you know, most of the plastic waste end up in the ocean and downgrade it into uh, microplastic, uh, nanoplastic, and gonna further pollute our environment for hundreds of years. So this is really the worst device ever. So the second generation is the e-cigarettes with pre-filled or refillable cartridge. And the third generation is the one that we have seen a lot right now. It's uh, <clears throat> something we call a mod. It's modifiable e-cigarette device. It has a refillable tank. So one major feature of this third generation of e-cigarette device is uh, it come up with a sub-ohm tank. The sub-ohm tank contains a low resistance coil. It is designed to create a large clot, which is aerosols, with a stronger delivery of heat of nicotine or other combust uh, uh, substances. Uh, uh, okay, there's the request to activate CC. I don't know how to do that. Patreon, shall I try to do that? Uh, keep going, uh, keep going. We're gonna, I'm figuring it out on the background. So folks, apologies for that. I appreciate your patience. Oh, right, you to control how to, it. Yeah, Got how it. to control it over here. Got it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> while there's a newer generation of e-cigarette device, it's called a pod mods. So uh, the major difference between the new generation compared to the previous generation is uh, they don't use the freestanding uh, nicotine. So uh, instead, they use nicotine salts. So nicotine salts actually is, uh, has a much lower pH compared to free-based nicotine. So this way, it's a lot, particularly high levels of nicotine to be inhaled more easily and with less irritation to throat than free base nicotine. So basically, as you can see here, the idea is to design the device as much as possible to deliver as a higher possible po uh, 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 nicotine as possible, and also to attract as many users as possible. Okay. So the central part, the central part of this uh, uh, e-cigarette device is the e-liquid. Is a liquid fill in the uh, the cartridge. So here I show the uh, the diagram for the two different e liquids. One is a regular e liquid. Another one is cannabis e liquid. You can consider the first one to be a legal e liquid that you can buy from any vaping store, and the second one is more like an illegal because it contains THC and CBD. <clears throat> So for today's talk, I'm mostly gonna focus on uh, the regular e-liquid. It's a legal one that you are able to purchase from any weeping uh, store. So the e-liquid is a liquid that is converted into a aerosol by an e-cigarette or weeping product. <clears throat> it's typically a mixture of water, food grade flavoring, a choice of nicotine level, and uh, two different kinds of oil. First one is uh, propelling glycol is PG. The second one is vegetable glycerin, VG. All cannabis is THC, CBD in illegal 
uh, e-liquid that I'm not going to cover for today's talk. <clears throat> so the two solvents being used in this in this device, in the e-liquid, PG and VG uh, uh, humectants used in e-liquid to, pro to uh, produce aerosols that simulate combustible tobacco cigarette smoke. Basically, it's create this kind of clot away. <clears throat> so the ratio of PG and VG in the e-liquid can change based on whether flavor, which is a, a, a plume, is more desired. If you want to have more flavor, uh, uh, you want to have a higher level of PG. If you want to have a more large clot when, you, uh, when you're waiting, so you're going to use uh, more VG in your uh, uh, device. Usually, and for most of the commercial device, the PG and VG volume ratio is one to one. So as you can see here in summary, there are three different liquids. There are three different chemicals being used in e-liquid. The first is going to be the oil solvent, which is PG and VG. The second part is going to be nicotine. So the third part is the flavor. Among all three of them, the flavoring are used in e-cigarettes as a major marketing tool to attract youth, young adult and adult users. And this is center part of this device. So here actually I'm gonna challenge the audience and to think about it, how many flavors or e-cigarette flavors are available on the market? Can you name it? Can you count it? So I give you a couple of seconds to think about that. So strawberry, vanilla, chocolate, tobacco. You can think about how many that you can count. Well, and here I show you. On this slide, actually I show you, those are the number of flavor available on the market. And if I keep doing this, I can do this for another 15 pages. And this one page actually shows about a thousand about a thousand different flavors. If I do another 15 pages, actually there are a total of 15,000, 16,000 of them. Huge, huge number of flavor combination. Whatever you like about, you perhaps gonna find the, you find the flavor available in the market. <clears throat> actually research shows that as of 2018, there were more than 15,000 different e-cigarette flavor blends. And this 15,000 e-cigarette e flavor blends belong to 13 main different categories. So those categories are tobacco, menthol, fruit, dessert, alcohol, nut, spice, candy, coffee, tea, beverage, sweet-like, unspecified, and unflavored. <clears throat> and each of these flavors is made of combination of virus flavoring chemicals. It's usually not a single chemical. So, and it's usually made of various flavoring chemicals at various concentrations with a total of flavor chemical in the, in the concentration range of one to four weight percents, which is 10 to 40 milligram per meal of the e-liquid. So <clears throat> this slice listed the top 25 chemical most frequently added to e-cigarette product as a flavor. As you can see here, the most commonly used flavoring chemical is uh, vanillin. Uh, vanillin. The vanillin has been used for a sweet, uh, uh, creamy, for this kind of taste of, of e-cigarette. The second place, it's isomodal. Isomodal has been used for sweet, fruit-like, and uh, uh, cotton candy. The third one is acibutyrate. Acid, so it has been used for fruit with butter, pineapple, banana, ripe fruit, and juicy nose taste. So those are the top three chemical has been added into the e-cigarette device to serve as a component of flavoring. 
Among this list, I want also want to show you Menso. So Menso is within the top 20 is the 19th in this rank. So it's mostly, this is the chemical being used in the menthol flavor and mint flavor e-cigarettes. The reason I point out this is because menthol flavor usually being used with a much higher concentration compared to any other chemical being used in e-cigarettes. So here I mentioned three specifically <clears throat> from this list. We pick up three chemical to study. The first one, the second one, and the third one is menthol. We study menthol because it's among the top 20 frequently added flavor chemical in e-cigarette with a concentration. It could really high, it could be at high at 84 milligram per meal. We are curious about how this chemical going to affect your lung if you inhale this into your lung together with your e-cigarette aerosols. So there are some basic information about menthol. <clears throat> so menthol is a chemical naturally found in peppermint and other mint uh, plants, but it can also be made in a lab. So in other words, they are able to, we are able to synthesize and menthol in research lab. So menthol is a commonly used penetration enhancer for topical drug administration in dermatology because it disturbs lipid packing in the membrane structure of the skin cells. So menthol was first added to tobacco in the 1920s and 1930s. So the menthol reduced the harshness of uh, cigarette smoke and the irritation from nicotine. And the 2009 Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act that gives FDA authority over tobacco products, menthol was the only flavor allowed in cigarettes in sufficient quantity. So almost all cigarettes sold in the United States contain some na natural or lab created menthol. Tobacco companies have relied on uh, has relied on the smoothing and uh, soothing and cooling effects of menthol to make cigarettes more appealing to new smokers. So it's estimated that more than 18.9 million people currently smoke menthol e-cigarettes. In 2019 and in 2020, sales of menthol flavored cigarettes made up 37% of all cigarette sales in the United States. United States. It's a very large business. And however, on the one side, on the one hand, we have seen a lot of tobacco product with menthol. On the other hand, we also have to point out that there are emerging research regarding the negative health impact of menthol, especially in e-cigarettes. Here I listed a few of them. So first, menthol numbs the lung. Well, actually that's the purpose. That's the purpose actually why this uh, manufacturer used menthol in the e-cigarette product. So the menthol reduced the uh, perceived, perceived airway irritation and harshness produced by inhalation of high concentration of nicotine. And pod-based menthol flavor e-cigarettes caused mitochondrial dis dysfunction in lung epithelial cells. And some fa fairly new research, I listed the year of the research, and some fairly new research shows that acute exposure to menthol containing e-cigarette aerosols adversely affected human bronchial epithelia in a manner that could lead to respiratory disease. And finally, and we found that actually menthol flavor e-cigarette inhibits the biophysical function of lung surfactant. This is the paper we published last year, and this is also going to be the topic that I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on uh, in the next part of this presentation. 
So <clears throat> the second part of this talk, I'm going to talk about specific about our research. I'm going to focus on lung surfactants, smart droplet techniques we have developed, and also the in vitro biophysical simulation of aerosol surfactants interactions. Well, this research will be based on, uh, mostly based on the research paper we published last year uh, uh, in American Journal of Physiology Lung. So the title of the paper is Menso in Electric Cigarettes Cause Biophysical Inhibition of Pulmonary Surfactants. So this paper uh, after published uh, in September, uh, uh, this has been selected as an APS select paper, which is the one of the highest uh, honor uh, for uh, American Physiology Society. Well, uh, first of all, if we try to understand that, you know, how this research is then, first of all, we need to know that how does aerosol get into your lung? So you can imagine that when you inhale any particle into your lung, into, uh, into your lung actually uh, uh, is either a particle or aerosol, it's actually is a long way to go after you inhale it until it gets into the lung. As a matter of fact, not all of this particle or aerosol will get into the lung. It, uh, the determining factor that decides if a particle will go to the lung or not depends on the size of the particle. So if a particle size is a bit large, let's say that particle larger than 10 micron in, uh, in diameter. Uh, if you wanna figure out how small it is, uh, you can think about that your hair, the thickness of human hair is roughly about a 50 micron. Uh, so that is the size range we are talking about. So if a particle in the size range about 10 micron, and those particles will be trapped uh, in the tracheal and bronchi, it's not gonna go further. So because in the upper airway, we have this kind of like a very small hair structure, it's called a thela. So this guy moving, you know, upward, upward motion. So in other words, any particle come to this region, if it's large enough, it's gonna be pushed out, pushed out as, as uh, you know, you're gonna cough it out. So it's not gonna get down into the lung. So this kind of clearance mechanism is called uh, mucociliary clearance. So only the smaller particle is possibly to penetrate deep into the lung. And especially when the particle is small enough down to about five micron in that range, it's perhaps gonna get into the lung. So this is a very, very strange, uh, interesting uh, phenomenon. So when the particle is too large, it's not gonna get in the lung. And particle, when the particle is also too small, let's say in the nanometer range, it's also not gonna get into the lung. Only in the certain range, let's say five micron range, has the highest possibility to get into the lung. So once a particle gets into the lung and, and this particle will be cleaned by microphage clearance. So microphage, uh, microphage clearance is actually basically is when a particle gets into the lung, is the particle going to uh, signaling the microphage come to eat those particles. You can imagine if you have a lot of particle, especially e-cigarette particle, which is more like an oily droplet get into your lung, that's gonna cause a lot of burden to microphage. As a matter of fact, this is the one demonstrated negative effect of e-cigarette, which is cause a, 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 a lipid laden uh, a microphage, cause a lot of burden to uh, the microphage clearance. If you try to understand that how does the immune system work in the lung, how does the uh, uh, microphage come to notice the particle and clean it? You need to understand lung surfactant. Lung surfactant is a phospholipid protein mixture synthesized by type two epithelial cell. The composition of lung surfactant is mostly phospholipid and small amount of cholesterol and 10% of surfactant protein. There are 10 of protein. SPA, B, C, and D. 
out of the ten, of the four proteins, the two larger protein, SPA and D, they are immunological protein. So their function is to label any alien particle get into the lung, so signaling the microphage to clear to clear it up. So therefore, the major function of lung surfactant is twofold. The first function is immunological function, the host defense against any inhaled pathogen particles. And the second most important functionality of lung surfactant is to reduce alveolar surface tension. So this is actually the function I want to put a lot of emphasis on. So first of all, what is surface tension? What is surface tension? Why you need to have a low surface tension in your lung? So here I show you a small uh, uh, experiment that you can do in your kitchen and bathroom to show surface tension effects. So basically what it's doing here is you pick up a soap film. This water is a soap water with soap and detergent in there. As you can see here, once you pick up the film, it's automatically shrink to the shape of a meniscus. If you want to stretch it, you're going to have to put a force in it. As soon as you release the force, the film go back to the minimum surface area. I'll show you one more time. You pick up the film from soap water. It automatically shrink to the minimum surface area with a meniscus shape. If you want to increase in the surface area of the film, you're going to have to input energy. When you release your hand, it go back to the minimum surface area. So this tells you that actually the surface tension going to automatically, automatically decreasing the surface area of the surface. So as a matter of fact, many physical phenomena in reality is one directional. It's only happening spontaneously in one direction. Like for example, you have a glass of coffee, you leave it uh, uh, next to you. Uh, after half an hour, you realize that the coffee become colder, colder. But the coffee is not gonna automatically become warmer. If you want to make a coffee warmer, you're gonna to have to warm up. The cooling process only happening in one directional. So it's losing heat. So a lot of phenomenon in reality is going one directional. So the same thing for surface tension effect. So as you can see here, the surface tension gonna automatically reducing surface area. If you wanna increase in surface area, you're gonna to have, to, to have to counteract, overcome the surface tension effect. So this is what happened in our lung. You can imagine that actually our lung has a very large surface area. Why? Because you know, the functionality of the lung is to exchange gas. In order to exchange gas efficiently, we need a large surface area. As a matter of fact, the surface area of the lung is equivalent to a badminton court. It's that much of surface area. To maintain the surface area that big, you need to reduce surface tension Otherwise, you cannot open up your lung. So a human body do that with lung surfactants. So because of the importance of lung surfactants, if you do not have surfactants in your lung, that's going to be a problem. So this happened to premature babies. When baby burn too early, when baby burn too early, their lung cell is not mature enough. They can't synthesize surfactants. So the consequence here is the surface tension in the lung is so high that the lung cannot be opened up. So in other words, a, a large portion of the lung will collapse. So if you look at a tissue, the lung tissue for normal alveolars, as you can see here, you have a very large space of air space, a very thin, uh, very thin uh, blood air barrier. So uh, which uh, is important for efficient gas exchange. However, for premature animal, if you look at lung tissue, you have a very limited airspace and much thicker barrier for gas exchange between uh, the air and capillary blood. So in that case, 
the baby born too early, they don't have surfactant enough, they cannot open up their lung, so that they won't be able to brace. To treat those baby, what we do is we actually <clears throat> let the baby to uh, brace in uh, surfactants extracted from animals' lungs. And we can temporarily save those babies to give them more time to develop their own surfactant system. The same situation actually also happened to adult patients. So for adult patients, uh, one signature disease is acute respiratory distress syndrome, so ARDS. Before COVID, ARDS has a mortality rate of about 30%. After COVID, because most of COVID patients uh, at a very severe, cage, uh, uh, severe stage, they all develop ARDS. So the mortality rates of, of ARDS has significantly increased. So what happening here is, is the SARS-CoV-2 virus can get into the lung, uh, get into the lung alveolar region. And the ACE2 receptor is highly expressed on type 2 epithelial cell. So as you can see here, the type 2 epithelial cell and the SARS-CoV-2 virus going to bend with each other, start causing infection to the lung. And the lung gonna fill with edema. It's like a water, a liquid. So that causes a lot of inflammation. So that is how this COVID related ARDS has been developed. And in this case, the surfactants also going to be inactivated, inhibited, so that this patient cannot brace easily. So therefore, there is a clinical trial going on to use surfactant therapy to treat COVID patients just to buy them more time to, for the treatment. So speaking of that, <clears throat> surfactant is very important. If the surfactant does not function, you cannot brace. So therefore, we came up with a hypothesis for a new alternative method to predict acute lung toxicity. When I say new alternative method, this is a terminology I've been used for FDA. So means alternative to animal test. As you may know that actually FDA heavily rely on animal test for studying the toxicity of any substance or drugs. So however, there is new trending, which is to reduce animal use. So in other words, uh, the development of new alternative measure to predict acute lung toxicity. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I am invited to give a talk uh, in FDA next week to talk about our method as a new potential new alternative method. So the idea of this is, the hypothesis is, biophysical properties of endogenous home surfactants is highly sensitive to disturbance of inhaled particles and aerosols I just talked about in the previous slides. And therefore, in vitro, pulmonary surfactant inhibition could be used as a new alternative method to predict the acute lung toxicity of particles and aerosols with controlled dosimetry. So and this is a cover image we published a couple of years ago in the journal, Biophysical Journal. Uh, I think it's illustrated the idea very well. And so this is actually, one half of this picture shows uh, single alveolars, which is the bubble in your lung. And the other half of this is our droplet technique. What we are doing here is we're using a droplet technique to simulate the surfactant film at the air water surface. As you can see here, even though this two uh, system, alveolar and our model are very different in terms of the actual uh, 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 nature of, uh, of the uh, system, but in terms of air water surface along surfactant film, uh, we are able to find a lot of similarity between these two. So therefore, we should be able to use this as a new alternative method, uh, in vitro model to study the ac acute lung toxicity of aerosols get into your lung. So this is the hardware we have been developed in my research lab called Constraint Drop Surfactometry. So, and the central part of this is a droplet. And we have also developed a very complicated, sensitive, software called a closed loop axisymmetric dropship analysis allow us to do the control and calculation in real time. 
So here I show you a real simulation we have done in my research lab. Now you're looking at the droplet. The droplets it look like a black color is because you're looking at the shadow of the droplet. It actually is a water droplet. The water droplet with the surfactant extracted from cow slum. So, and the diameter of the droplets about like a three millimeter in diameter, three millimeter in diameter, the very tiny droplets. What we are doing here is <clears throat> we are oscillating the droplet. We withdraw water from the droplet. As you can see here, the droplet become flatter. When we're in, injecting water into the droplet, droplet become fatter. So on, on the other hand, on the other side, we calculate the surface tension of the droplet against the surface area oscillation. The fact that actually the droplet become flatter is actually means that you have a very low surface tension. When the droplet become rounder, you have a high surface tension. So in this way, we are able to simulate the surface tension variation in human lung. And we have compared this to animal test. It's actually a, more like a perfect match. So this shows the device that actually we've been used for study uh, the aerosol effect. So we're going to, we correlate the CDS technique together with the e-cigarette generator. So we generate e-cigarettes with a certain component composition uh, that we want to study. And we deliver the drug, deliver the aerosol into the chamber with a controlled concentration. And we study how this is going to affect your lung. So specific for e-cigarette device, we use a modifiable device. MOT, which is the third generation of e-cigarette device. And we have a coil resistance of 0 0.016 uh, ohm, power 60, 60 watt, temperature is less than 300 degree. For the puff profile, we also try to simulate the real puff, uh, inhalation and people vaping. So the puff duration is three seconds. Time break between puffs is 25 seconds. Aerosol generated per puff is 10 milligram. So aerosol density per puff is 25 milligram, uh, uh, 25 microgram per uh, 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 for a cubic centimeter. So all of this is a simulation of real inhalation or real weeping. So the chemical we use, the lung surfactants we use is a surfactant extract from cow's lung, the bovin lipid extract surfactants. Its composition is very similar to human. So for the specifically for uh, e-cigarette, uh, we use a recombinant e-liquid. In other words, we separate the different components of e-liquid and we recombine it so that, which allow us to study the effect of each individual component uh, in the e-liquid. The first component is a solvent. It's a 50-50 uh, combination of PG and VG. Uh, and nicotine, which put this in a six milligram per meal. And we study three different flavors, menthol, uh, 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 menso, uh, asom, uh, asomato, and asobutyrate. Uh, uh, so the three commonly used chemical for e-cigarette flavor. So here I show the results. The results is quite a massive, but I don't want to go to the detail. Uh, I just want to show you some highlights of this research. Uh, this figure shows surface tension against different components. As I mentioned before, higher surface tension is bad. So this black color is natural surfactant without any aerosol. So as you can see here, it's a very low surface tension. So when you're putting in the different components of e-cigarette aerosol, the surface tension keep increasing, which is indicating that's how bad it is. As you can see here, for all the different combinations we have been studied, you always have the highest surface tension, the red color, indicated by red color. So those are the e-cigarette aerosol that contain menthol. So from this, we know that menthol is the most important component that's caused a problem to lung surfactants. We don't know why. Actually, you know, we have done a lot of chemical and biophysical assay to figure out 
why Mansell caused so much problem? So actually we have studied CD and NMR and molecular dynamic simulation and many different kind of you know, uh, measurements. We figure out that actually it's because Mansell actually has a particular interaction with the phospholipid and protein in the lung surfactants and therefore the damaged surfactant system. Uh, finally, I wanna show that actually our data has been confirmed by another research lab. So here I show you the data from my colleague's research lab, you know, Rudy's lab in uh, St. Joseph Hospital in London, Ontario, Canada. He has done similar research as what we are doing. He studied many different combinations of flavor and nicotine. He found that actually there's one combination really increasing the surface tension a lot, which is that contained menthol. It also shows that menthol flavor e-cigarette aerosol causes the most damage to the lung surfactant films. Uh, I put a quotation mark here in the independent. It's, uh, it's, it's not a completely independent research because I'm also the co-author of the paper because actually Rudy is also using a CDS technique. Uh, uh, but uh, I do not do any of this experiments and all the experiments is then independently uh, in Rudy's lab in Canada. It pretty much showed that you know our results has been confirmed by another research lab. So this is actually is what we have found out. Uh, pretty much, you know, this is going to uh, um, be my talk. So uh, next, I'm going to use another five minutes uh, to wrap up the talk with uh, what does the research tell us. So first question I usually been asked is. Is vaping safe? Well, and to answer this question, uh, I want to point out that actually uh, the long-term toxicological effect of vaping only starts emerging in recent years. And this is very important because, you know, a uh, lot of people tell me, hey, how come that we never heard about this research a few years ago? And because we don't know that. So as I mentioned before, the e-cigarette actually entered market in the middle 2000s. Any long-term toxicology data only start showing up after 10 years. So right now, there are a lot of data shows the problem of e-cigarettes, which make a lot of sense because that's about the time. So think about how much uh, uh, they take how long for us to understand the pro problem caused by cigarette smoking. So it takes a long time. So <clears throat> vaping has, a lot of research has shown that vaping has become an established risk factor for a range of pulmonary and cardi cardiovascular diseases. Here I just list a few. So vaping is linked to asthma and other chronic lung disease in use, and chronic exposure to e-cigarette aerosol can alter lipid homeostasis in the lung, downregulate uh, down the innate immune immunity, damage DNA, and, and thus increasing the risk of lung cancer. And vaping caused adverse uh, neurodevelopmental outcome in a uh, uh, prenatal mouse model, those such as at least a few of the research. There are many, many of this research start showing up in the past five years. So there's something you might be remember as before the pandemic as the E Valley uh, outbreak in August, 2019. So it's the e-cigarette or vaping use associated lung injury called the E Valley. So as of February 18, 2020, a total of more than 2000 hospitalized E Valley cases of deaths have been reported to CDC from all 50 states and DC and the two US territories. So that is a big thing before the pandemic has started. <clears throat> so therefore, I can answer this question safely is, vaping is not as safe as originally promised. So the second question is, is menthol toxic? Somebody say, oh, gee, I just have a, a, a mentos. Is that going to kill me? <laughs> Perhaps not. So because when you talk about uh, toxicology, uh, you need to understand the toxicity of the substance 
largely depends on two factors. The first one is dosage. When something is too much, that's, you know, even sugar, salt's going to kill you. So, and another one is exposure rot. So as we know that actually menso has been used for many, many years, mostly for external use. So, and if something means for external use, you brace it into your lung, there's no guarantee that it's going to be safe. So that's why there's two factors we need to keep into consideration. So specific for menso. So the early in vivo experiment suggests that long-term 13 weeks experiment inhalation of tobacco smoke with a low menthol concentration at five milligram per meal caused no substantial adverse effect on rats. However, and the menthol concentration being used in e-cigarettes is much higher than that. So most flavoring used in e-cigarettes, including menthol, are food grade additives and sense their safety and health impact on the respiratory system at levels inhaled by e-cigarette users, especially menthol up to 84 milligram per meal has not been, has, has been largely unknown. So this is what I try to point out with this seminar. And to conclude the talk, so menthols used in e-cigarette plays a predominant role in inhibiting the biophysical function of natural lung surfactants. The mechanism of biophysical inhibition appear, appear to be involved in menthol interactions with both phospholipid and protein. And the third conclusion is a better understanding of the health impact and better regulation of e-cigarettes or weeping products, especially menthol flavor e-cigarettes is urgently needed. I think urgently needed is not just a wording. So as a matter of fact, I do have a background. The additional background here is, as you know, that menthol is the last and the only flavor that is allowable in combustible cigarette market in the United States. On April 29, 2021, FDA made an announcement to ban menthol in all cigarettes and flavored cigars within a year. If the ban were in first, research predict that up to 30% current menthol cigarette smokers would switch to e-cigarettes, and this would quickly expand the market of menthol flavored e-cigarette. Therefore, there is indeed an urgent need to understand more about the health impact of flavored e-cigarettes, especially menthol flavored e-cigarettes. So I want to thank uh, my students who work on this research and also my collaborator, uh, Eleanor and Ray and in chemistry department. Uh, we are grateful to the support from National Science Foundation and uh, also from Hawaii Community Foundation, especially I want to thank my Hawaii Community Foundation who support me to start this research back to five years ago. I also found to thank, want to thank the ONY Biotech who donated uh, and, and blessed biochemicals who donated surfactant sample for our research. And finally, I want to wrap up my talk with the slogan of American Lung Association. Uh, when you can't brace, nothing else matters. Okay, thank you for attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zhou. I, I feel a lot smarter. <laughs> and I, I, I mean that honestly. We have a few questions that have come in, but I, I, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, when I was, you know, I remember being back in the, you know, early 2010s, 20, you know, 12, 2013, when uh, these e cigarettes were sort of being developed. And it was originally thought to be the possibility of it being um, something that would, that, that could help people quit smoking. That was the original you know, thought when they were, they were they were being worked on in Europe. Obviously, that's not the route that these products have gone, and they're not recommended now for people who are trying to quit smoking. However, one of the things that in those in those uh, early conferences where they were trying to figure out the dosage of the various chemicals as they were inhaled into the lungs, um, is that they couldn't quite replicate uh, dosage systems because they said that that human usage. Is, is, is so different, right? Like you can suck really hard, you can hold it really long. And, and so there's that, but there was also that the manufacturers, because there was no standardization like there is with tobacco, uh, combustible tobacco, that every device was slightly different and would put out different kinds of chemicals depending as to the pressure and the amount. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that, how you standardize that and, and why you chose to do it that way? 
But yes, that's a very, very good question. So I think one problem of the e-cigarette market right now is actually most of research call for uh, more better regulations because right now it's, they're not regulated very well. So, and uh, for example, if you look at the number of flavors available right now in the market, 15,000 of them. So that actually most of the flavor being used by the e-cigarette manufacturer, they do not actually release the full recipe of how they actually make those flavors. So that actually very often that if you check the package, you don't even see that actually, you don't see the flavor, but you don't know that what kind of chemical being added to it and what kind of concentration being used. So actually when we do the research, actually, as you can see here, we use different concentration for different flavor chemicals. So we got this mostly from research data. So that actually not from the manufacturer of the e-cigarette company, they're not going to tell you that. So, mm -hmm. and actually what you can do is you got a sample of e-liquid actually you put into a machine uh, and analytical chemistry machine uh, that actually allow you to analyze the composition. So that is how we uh, got those data. So, and basically what we found that actually uh, for this particular flavor of menthol, and this chemical has been used in a much higher concentration than any other chemical flavor chemical being used in e-cigarettes, which is certainly a red flag. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Here's a question that, that has come in. Does menthol make tobacco products more addictive? Uh, that is, I don't know. <clears throat> so I guess, you know, uh, 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 when we talk about addictive, actually, mostly we talk about, you know, uh, neurological developments of how you accept this, this, this taste or whatever. So I think one thing that actually, uh, why the menthol flavor is so popular, uh, there is a reason be behind that. Actually, uh, as I show you in the talk, actually, the, this kind of chemical going to numb your uh, 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 respiratory system. They're gonna, they, they, have a, they have a chemical effect that's going to numb your uh, uh, airway to make this aerosol, the harsh, it's supposed to be a harsh taste and aerosol taste not as harsh as it was. So, and, and they basically play a trick and, uh, and with your brain, so that actually fool your brain that actually so that you can inhale it into your lung. So there is a certain reason for menthol flavor, why it is so popular, why it's so popular. So perhaps this is going to cause addictive, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, here's an interesting one. Uh, it says, that at the end of your talk, you talked about prenatal damage found in mice. What kind of, a first, uh, what kind of adverse effects were found? <clears throat> well, that is the research actually I listed. So there. So, and as a matter of fact, there's many, many research about e-cigarettes uh, uh, available on, uh, in the scientific community right now. So the one that I put in there is just one of the research. I found it, I personally found it very interesting. What they do here is they use the uh, uh, pregnant uh, uh, mouse model. So to let the mouse actually inhale the aerosol, an uh, e-cigarette aerosol. And then they study that how this e-cigarette aerosol gonna affect uh, uh, the newborns of this uh, 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 the, the, the mouse. So that actually found that there is some kind of neurodevelopmental problem uh, uh, being passed to the baby, uh, to the newborn of the mouse. Well, and that's really remarkable. I mean, the part of the, I mean, we, we, we've heard this time and time again as to how this is a safer alternative and how you're not inhaling as many chemicals. Um, so this actually new uh, next question is actually really important to that. What do you think that the long-term studies may find in regards to menthol and uh, surfactant damage in the future? Yeah, like that's another- the things that, that I think they're still- mm -hmm. That's another very good question. So actually when I gave similar talk uh, last year uh, uh, in a uh, local conference, you were also there. So that actually the, uh, the, the e-cigarette conference, uh, uh, we have uh, another fellow ask a similar question. So first of all, I won't be able to answer it because you know our research to simulate is to simulate acute inhalation. So that actually we simulate that actually one time deal. So for one time you inhale a large amount of aerosol get into your lung, how this is gonna affect your surfactants. So for long-term effect, I won't be able, our experiments won't be able to predict the long-term effect. However, from research point of view, so I can, you know, just briefly just, just predict that, you know, if your surfactant system keep damaged uh, like this on daily basis, 
basis for uh, many, many years, uh, I would see that actually this in the long term is not going to be good for you. That's for sure. So, and whether it's going to develop into a lung cancer or uh, uh, respiratory stress, uh, I don't know, but certainly and uh, damaging for the phospholipid protein is quite obvious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and, and I think that also the it's very telling what you had, uh, that last research that showed that for people who use menthol in combustible cigarettes, that they're likely to turn to e-vape um, and, and use you know the same amount of the or, or continue to use tobacco in that matter if um, if menthol is banned. So I'll I'll end with this question, which I think is a is a provocative question. Let's see if you if you if you want to talk about it. Why do you think that menthol hasn't been banned yet, considering the amount of evidence that there is about the damage that it can do to uh, human health? <laughs> well, uh, uh, well, I, I can answer the question from the point of view of a, a regular. Uh, individual of this country. So not based on research, because, you know, I'm not doing research on social science. I'm not doing research on, you know, uh, economy. So uh, um, I think the reason is very obvious, you know, uh, and it's a huge business. It's a huge business. So, and if you look at uh, my uh, introduction slides, I talk about the inconvenience uh, truth about menthol. So if you look at that, you know, how huge the market right now with the menthol flavor cigarettes and cigar, and it's a huge, huge business. And as a matter of fact, uh, nearly 100% of cigarettes, uh, uh, cigarette uh, products in the United States contain a certain level of menthol. Mm -hmm. It just more or less, they all contain a certain level of menthol. So the menthol, it... They play the trick when the menthol is ac actually get into your lung together with the tobacco. We talk about the traditional combustion tobacco with a tobacco particle is is get into the lung. It, this kind of particle you don't want this kind of particle get into the lung. You know your body doesn't like it. Maybe you like it, but your body doesn't like it because it's irritating. So that actually when you have menthol, this chemical in it, it actually numb your airway so that actually your body feel more accessible to this kind of to this kind of particle so this really make uh, 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 this uh, smoking much much easier <laughs> I, I think and, that and, is well and I was gonna I was gonna ask you about about this uh, there's some, this last question that came in from our uh, Don Wiseman who's our friend at the American Heart Association. Uh, that is sort of in relation to this. It says the tobacco industry documents show that the industry used cocoa as an additive to cigarettes because when cocoa is burned, it acts as, as a uh, bronchodilator and allows for deeper inhalation of nicotine into the lungs. Does cocoa, when heated in e-cigarettes, have a similar effect, and is it being used similarly in e-cigarettes? Obviously, you're not doing research on this, but would like to get your opinions. That's interesting. It's good to know. I, I don't know that before. And but it sounds like it makes a lot of sense because you know, and there, there are several things that actually can help the particle get into your lung. So that actually dilation is actually uh, certainly one uh, important uh, factor. So that actually you you can, if you can temporarily dilate your uh, airway to make this particle more accessible, that's of course is uh, easier to get the particle down into lung, and also. Uh, uh, you know, once the particle gets into the lung, the good thing about this is, is actually it's going to, the nicotine is going to get into your blood quicker. So that actually, you're going to feel this kind of excitement. So, uh, and the reasoning of smoking uh, much quicker and, and, and uh, much more intense. So, which is understandable. So, and menthol is doing the same, same thing with different trick. What it does is it just, it's not your airway so that. Uh, even though it's irritating, but you don't feel that much of irritation, so that the particle can get get down there uh, easier, quicker. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Zhou, thank you so much. Thank you for for creating uh, a presentation for those of us who are not as 
as, uh, <laughs> as have as many degrees as you do, I would be able to understand the, the, the research you're doing is incredibly important. And please let us know how we can support your, your work. Um, please thank all of your collaborators, your students, because this is a really incredible work that I think will be able to aid our quest here in Hawaii and across the nation. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for your interest. Thank you so much for your support of our Wonder research. Wonderful. And so we'll move on to our panelists for now. I, it is my great pleasure to introduce our panelists for the next portion of the webinar. Our panelists are Sun Choi, who is the Health Promotions Manager at the American Lung Association in Hawaii. Over the last several years, Sun has had the opportunity to dive into the world of tobacco control and lung health. During her last semester at Purdue University, she served as an advocacy and policy intern at the American Lung Association, and she continued her work in tobacco control at Partners for Wellness, where she worked on passing two flavor ban, that went passing flavor ban in two cities. Our second panelist is Valerie Saiki. Valerie lives on Kauai and serves as the island's community coordinator for the Coalition for Tobacco Free Hawaii, a program under the Hawaii Public Health Institute. Previously, Valerie provided tobacco prevention and cessation services to youth on Kauai at schools and other youth serving organizations, and has also worked for the Kauai District Health Office. Valerie is a 2018 graduate of the Leadership Kauai program. And our final panelist is Joshua Ching. Josh has been working with a number of anti-tobacco advocacy organizations, including the Coalition for a Tobacco-Free Hawaii uh, Youth Council and the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids over the past five years uh, to push legislative solutions to the vaping epidemic. Currently, he's a freshman at Yale University and is working on culturally informed smoking cessation programs for indigenous communities. Thank you so much for the three of you for joining us. Uh, let's go ahead and, and, and bring them onto the screen. Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Sun, I'll start with you. Um, so, you know, we just heard about essentially, we, we know that menthol is a, is a, is a very highly used uh, flavoring with youth. Uh, the American Lung Association has some programs that um, that we're working to be able to end uh, youth vaping epidemic. Could you go a little bit over some of those programs that the Lung Association has, please? Yeah, uh, thank you for everyone for being here. Um, and thank you, Pedro, for the introduction. Um, so I have a couple of slides I'd like to share. And just as a reminder to our participants, if you have questions for any of our panelists, you can enter it into the Q&A on the section below on your Zoom. Okay, so the American Lung Association aims to address youth tobacco use and youth vaping epidemic by expanding access to youth tobacco cessation programs and resources throughout Oahu. And so we are currently doing this specifically by training facilitators to lead not on tobacco and in death, as well as training healthcare professionals and other partners who work with youth um, on how to conduct a brief intervention for teens who use tobacco. And so the American Lung Association has two signature programs that are evidence-based and um, are meant to help schools and communities address tobacco and youth vaping, um, the youth, youth vaping epidemic. And so the two programs being in debt and not on tobacco. So the first program I'd like to speak about is our intervention for nicotine dependence through education, prevention, and prevention tobacco and health, also known as in depth. And in depth is an alternative to suspension or citation program that is offered as an option to middle school or high school students who face suspension for violation of school tobacco use policies. Um, so the program is not intended to be used as a prevention program. However, it is an interactive program that teaches students about nicotine dependence, um, establishing healthy alternatives and how to kick the um, unhealthy addiction that goes um, that gets them in trouble in the first place. And it was developed by the American Lung Association in partnership with the Prevention Research Center of West Virginia University. And in depth is taught by a trained facilitator in four 50 minute sessions and is mandatory for youth in order to fulfill the obligations for the code or the policy infraction. And even though that the program is an alternative for students who face violation of school tobacco um, use policies, the program can be implemented outside of a school setting. And this can include places like school, after school programs, alcohol and drug um, prevention centers youth detention centers or any 
other community settings who work with youth. And so what we focus on is getting facilitators trained so that facilitators are able to implement at their schools or the classes or programs or their community organizations. Um, the in-depth facilitator training is a free one hour online training for any adults who are interested in implementing the program at their school or youth centered community site. And with completion, facilitators will receive a three year certification and access to the in-depth facilitator facilitator guide um, and then among and then resources to plan and implement the program as well. Okay, our second signature program is focused on um, ending the youth uh, epidemic by um, cessation is our NOT on tobacco program. And so NOT is a youth cessation program for youth ages 14 to 19 years old. Um, it's offered as a voluntary quit tobacco use program for youth who are ready to begin their quit journeys. Um, so the program, a little bit of background, the program's been around for about 20 years and it's an evidence-based program and has a success rate of about 90%. So 90% of teens who participate in the program end up cutting back or quitting tobacco altogether. And what's been found is that post-program um, youth have also been shown to have better grades, higher motivation, fewer absences, um, better relationships with teachers and fewer school tobacco use policy violations. Um, and then like in death, NOT is also taught by a trained facilitator. Um, it is held in 10 50 minute sessions. And the really cool part about NOT is that unlike other youth cessation programs, which usually modify adult cessation, programs, um, not is and was designed with teens really in mind and address issues that are specifically important to them and takes a holistic approach with each session um, using different interactive learning strategies. Um, like I mentioned before, not is a voluntary program. Um, it's a voluntary cessation program for you who are ready to begin their quit journey. Um, it can be implemented in middle or high school settings, alcohol and drug prevention centers, health departments, community organizations, clinics, um, healthcare settings, as well as um, after school programs, or really any other community organizations or settings where um, they work with youth. So similar to the in-depth program, NOT is an online on-demand facilitator training course. Um, the training takes about seven hours to complete and includes the in-depth training. Um, but with NOT, there is a $400 registration fee. Um, so all trained facilitators will receive a three-year certification, um, curriculum, participant workbook um, to print on demand, as well as access to annual curriculum updates and much more. And to make more to make youth uh, vaping cessation more accessible and available in Hawaii, we are currently offering scholarships, making the training free. And the last program that we offer um, to address the youth vaping epidemic is our new program called Ask Council Treat to address youth cessation. Um, so the Ask Council Treat to address youth cessation program is a one hour um, online course based on the American Academy of Pediatrics guideline, um, youth, their youth tobacco cessation considerations for clinicians that aims to teach healthcare professionals, um, school personnel, and community members on how to conduct a brief intervention for teens who use tobacco. And the course outlines the steps of ask, counsel, treat, and provides guidance, um, support, and best practices for having an effective uh, conversation with youth ages um, 11 and up who use tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. Um, the brief intervention training is available for free for healthcare providers, public health professionals, school personnel, um, community members who work with youth. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention was that although not all the programs um, are strictly cessation programs. Um, the American Lung Association takes a holistic approach in ending the youth epidemic. So by offering resources to not only schools, but also community organizations, healthcare professionals, and to anyone who works with youth, um, and then also getting more adults trained and um, to become facilitators in these programs, um, especially sustainable programs, it helps youth quit 
by um, helping youth be, become more exposed um, to the facts of quitting and can ultimately help them feel more empowered to take the first steps to being tobacco free. Thank you for that, Sean. And that's a really uh, good overview of the various programs we have available. I know that, you know, Valerie, you, you, you've been in those groups where we have been struggling to find resources uh, to help youth quit uh, at particular community levels. You, uh, let's, let's switch to that. You're doing some community initiatives that have to do with, uh, with vaping and vaping prevention in particular. Can you talk to us a little bit about what's going on in Kauai? Uh, sure. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Valerie Psyche. I have been in tobacco control since about 2004. Um, I have been in various roles, so my current role does not provide any uh, cessation support. However, I do uh, provide trainings in the communities in regards to assisting other people. I just wanted to put that out there um, so you don't turn to the coalition for uh, cessation services, but uh, I can link you to other service providers in the community. But what I wanted to share today is like most of us in um, public health, we learn, we, um, learn how you want to help prevent the problem versus trying to solve the problem at the very end, you know, putting out the fire versus teaching people how to prevent fires from even starting. So I wanted to give a little brief scenario um, on a situation that happened for us uh, here on Kauai. I've uh, worked in tobacco control, mostly on Kauai uh, since 2004. Uh, I remember in 2007, I was asked, like, what am I going to do about the e-cigarettes that are going to be introduced soon and people that might switch or have questions or the kids that might try it or get addicted to it? And I'll be honest, I naively thought this wasn't going to be a problem. For me on Kauai, we had a situation here where there's a lot of people who were anti-GMO, uh, wanted everything to be organic. And so for me, when I think about that, I said, why would somebody take a synthetic product or a product that is chemically made and put it in their bodies when they're fighting so hard for healthy foods? And again, naively thought that. And it ended up being coming big and an epidemic. And within two years of being released on the market, we've already seen it in high schools on Kauai. And my very first uh, vape device that was confiscated was actually a $300 tank mod that a student brought to school from an older adult sibling. And that just right there tells you it's gonna spread like wildfire when they can steal that $300 device from an older sibling. And so that really got me into thinking, okay, how are we gonna educate the kids since I didn't prep for this? And by searching on the internet, and looking around, there still was very, very little research or even journal articles or just any type of research or data on these products. And it wasn't necessarily until like 2011 when we started seeing uh, research that was being put out with similar findings that I could say, okay, this is what we know about this product. Um, a lot of times when I was teaching earlier for high school students that had questions, I had to turn to my only resource, my actual friends who were vaping. How do you feel when you vape? What does it uh, feel like when you inhale? How does uh, the nicotine high work for you? Do you feel like you vape as much as you smoke cigarettes? How was the transition to um, changing the product versus uh, the cigarettes? and and that's where most of my information came. So, you know, I had a disclaimer, but this is all the information I had from actual users. And so it was really hard. Uh, so basically it was like, we're chasing the solution on how to put out the fire before we could even consider going back to prevention. And for me, I don't necessarily want to ban the product because that's not gonna help people in the end. I want people to learn about the dangers of this product so that they know that this is something that they don't wanna do. They don't wanna put in their body because if they can choose that route, 
for them to say no in their late teens, early 20s, even early 30s, it's going to be a lot more powerful and strong. So to me, prevention is the key. We need to educate students prior to being introduced to these products, which for some students is kindergarten. Um, I've had first graders who were caught with the product on campus because they have siblings or parents who use it and they just wanna bring it to school to show their friends. And because they can easily take it, put it in their bag, parents don't know, siblings don't know, grandparents don't know, they can easily bring it to school and that's where they get in trouble for it. So again, like I said, to me, prevention is gonna be key here because once they introduce the product into their bodies, and to be honest, did you die? That mentality is gonna be like, well, I tried it once and I didn't get cancer. I didn't go into cardiac arrest. I didn't have breathing problems. They're going to continue to use the product. But what they need to understand is it's not something that shows up fast with their symptoms. And it could be as little as two weeks. It could be as long as two years. But they need to understand this is a possibility and research proves it. And they cannot live with the it's not going to happen to me mentality. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Valerie. And, and, you know, we're talking a lot about youth <laughs> and we have uh, somebody who's still youthful enough, um, even though he's now in college. Uh, Josh, do, do am I remembering this correctly? You were last year's the National Advocate of the Year for the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. Yeah. Congratulations. Uh, and can, so can you tell us, you've been working a lot on policy for, for these many years to be able to deal exactly uh, with these issues that we're bringing up. Can you tell us a little bit about what those policies are and what exactly, you know, what exactly are we striving for? Yeah, so over the past five years, um, the Coalition for Tobacco-Free Hawaii, which is the primary organization that I've been working with and also the primary organization for advocacy efforts um, for tobacco regulation, has a number of dis different policy priorities that we've been striving for over the years. Um, the primary one has been ending the sale of flavored tobacco products, including menthol. Um, our other priorities include fighting for tax parity, since in Hawaii, there's no tobacco tax attached to e-cigarettes, um, increasing licensing and permitting regulations, um, and restricting online sales and shipment of tobacco products. Um, but for that primary one about ending the sale of tobacco products, um, we're primarily fighting for that one that has been one of the main policy priorities that we've been fighting for over the years, um, just because of the ways in which um, flavors in particular have been used uh, to mask the harsh taste of nicotine, allowing for higher nicotine concentrations in these products, um, and also increasing tolerance and dependence among youth. Um, I kind of think of it like drinking coffee. Um, the more pumps of a sugary syrup you put into your coffee, the more shots of bitter espresso you'll be able to handle. Um, and as a result, the more addicted you'll be to caffeine after repeated use. Um, I would know about that coffee one because that's me. Um, there are a number of different studies showing how um, you're more likely to continue vaping, take more puffs per vaping occasion in comparison to exclusively tobacco flavored or flavorless vapes. So there's a number of different ways in which those 15,500 flavors that are currently on the market are not only exploiting um, youth in particular, but also designed specifically for longevity, which is why we're trying to hit the industry where it hurts the most. Um, across the country, there have been a number of different flavored vape bans that have showed to uh, reduce retail sales of all flavored products um, by drastic amounts. Um, the recent ban in California, 2019 data from the YRBS survey found that in Oakland in particular, flavored tobacco product sales reduced by 96%. Um, there was also no evidence of a one-to-one -one substitution from using flavored tobacco to non-flavored tobacco either because total tobacco sales went down by 25%. Um, this is also reflected in states like Massachusetts, where there was a decrease of 89%, 31% in New York, 31% in Rhode Island, 25% in Washington. Um, routinely, time and time again, when these flavor bans have been put into law, um, there have been massive reductions in retail sales of all flavor products. Um, but of course, those legislative solutions aren't the, aren't the primary way to solve the problem. There are a number of different um, components that need to be considered as both Valerie and Son are talking about with prevention and cessation programs. Um, 
so yeah, that's basically the policy priorities we've been working with over the past few years. Um, we have a number of different advocacy strategies we've been using, meeting one-on-one -on -one with our legislators, community leaders, educators, neighborhood boards, law enforcement, Native Hawaiian health and civic organizations, and, and many more to rally support for our policy priority. Um, we've done a number of different sign-waving events. Um, uh, a couple years ago, we had the March Against Menthol, where across about 10 different sign waving locations across Hawaii, we had youth um, waving signs on streets and roads uh, to rally community support for our bill, which recently had an attempted exemption of menthol. Um, we also do a, a number of different press engagement um, opportunities, TV interviews, podcasts, um, trying to get op-eds and features in our local newspapers to highlight why this problem is such a big issue. And there's a number of different other related on the ground work that we've been doing as well. Large displays in front of the Capitol. Um, we typically do a bunch of different floaties in front of the state Capitol that spells out flavors hook kids. Um, and there are a number of different art projects that our youth are working on to also promote um, tobacco prevention, tobacco use prevention and cessation um, through a creative lens. So. Yeah, that's basic overview of our policy priorities and the number of different advocacy strategies we're using to push that forward. Let me uh, ask a follow up question, Josh. Uh, you know, when I was your age, when I was your age, uh, which was only two or three years ago, um, the, you know, Hawaii was a leader in the nation in passing tobacco control policy. You know, we were the first in the nation to pass the, the 21 um, tobacco law so that nobody under the age of 21 could legally purchase tobacco. We were one of the first few in the nation to be, have uh, secondhand smoke protections for all workers. Um, you know, we were, I believe, the first beach in the nation uh, that was able to ban smoking from the shore uh, because of how it affected the, the beach and the, the natural life that, that was in the waters. Why do you think that we have not been able to pass some of this legislation here in Hawaii, when you, you know, as you went through very meticulously, you know, has the laws that have passed in other states have shown the incredible impact that it can have. But what's your opinion about that? That is a great question and something I've been wondering about myself over the past few years. Um, some of the biggest challenges that we faced um, in the world of anti-tobacco advocacy has been, uh, the powerful, powerful economic interests and yeah, basically power of the tobacco industry um, that they often leverage through campaign donations or just a number of different lobbying tactics that they use for our lawmakers. Um, so time and time again, when we've tried to pass our bills, um, we've been seeing a number of different strategies used by our lawmakers and also the tobacco industry, like poison pill amendments, um, last, mil cha last minute changes to our bills, um, exemptions that are put in to try and provide loopholes for the industry, um, or just deals that are struck behind closed doors and conference committee. Um, and for me in particular, um, I personally believe that a lot of this has to do with that amount of influence that the tobacco industry has, the power of money and donations, and how that influences like lawmakers to do things that, you know, aren't necessarily for the greater good of um, the people of Hawaii, despite the countless organizations that we have in support of our policy priorities. Um, the vast majority of Hawaii residents, I think it's around 80% that support ending the sale of all flavored tobacco products. Um, there are just a number of different political and economic factors that unfortunately get tangled up into our advocacy work. Um, but for me in particular, I personally believe that because it's so hard, because it's such an uphill battle, um, it means that we are doing the right thing and combating one of the most powerful, powerful political forces in the American sphere today. And, you know, I think we're doing some pretty good work regardless of, you know, all of the challenges that come in our way definitely are. I mean, we must be doing something right if there's so many forces that are working against it. Um, Valerie, I, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, you talked a little bit about how, um, you know, you were you were working in tobacco control before. I remember being in that same field, you know, that we were sort of watching to see how vaping was going to take off. And then it really just took off like wildfire, as you mentioned, with the youth population. 
why do you think that that is? What do you think is the is the appeal other than the physical addiction that obviously happens with nicotine? What do you think was the appeal, um, you know, back then now as you've been working through all of these years uh, on this issue? Well, majority of it, as we all know, is the unknown, right? Um, adults didn't know what it was. You can get away with it. And it was the cool thing. And I do want to put it out there that social norms has a lot to do with a lot of how our culture responds to certain products. And so I'm sorry with the noise. Um, but what I wanted to point out is when I go in and I do my presentations, uh, I make sure it's age appropriate. So usually from seventh grade and older, I ask the question once I get into my introduction on uh, tobacco and various products, I ask them. Which sexually transmitted infection would you prefer, syphilis or gonorrhea? And the reason why is because at sixth grade or early seventh grade, they are in that chapter where they learn this is something they don't want. They don't want to experience. And you don't have to have it in order to know you don't want it. Therefore, I want to transition that thought where everyone screams neither to which is healthier, cigarettes or vaping. And they scream neither. Because right now, every single student that I ask that question to, they will choose either cigarettes or vaping as being healthier, but they don't realize that you cannot compare two unhealthy products to each other and tell me which one's better for you. And so I think it's the, the social belief to know that, is this a safer product or are they just both unhealthy and we should choose not to do it and to understand the multiple various ways to protect ourselves from them either by not doing it ourselves limit the exposure to secondhand smoke secondhand vape the same things that we teach um, in sex education uh, and we teach it before they hopefully before they are even engaged in that type of activity so they already have that mindset this is something I don't want I don't want to experience and I don't need in my life right now. And so I do compare that a lot to my seventh and older um, students. And I think it's a great example because you will just see it when I ask that question. Everyone screams neither because that's the social acceptable answer when it comes down to cigarettes and vaping. Well, I have parents that do it. I have uh, relatives that do it. My older sibling does it. So then that becomes an excuse of it can't be that bad if my family, who are good people, are doing it. And so that's the kind of education that I wanted to put out there in order to create that prevention. Because to me, even a teen who might even still be addicted or who might be addicted to cigarettes by the number of... Um, of the milligram content of nicotine that they consume each day, I still think they're in the trial phase. They're experimenting. Uh, cessation is helpful, but it's still a part of prevention with the education that they're getting uh, because they're still in that gray area of, do I wanna continue to use this product? And why am I using this product versus I need this product to function today, which to me is, an adult classification of an adult addiction. Yeah, and I think that that's a really great point because one of the things that, you know, is we're investing our dollars in prevention and cessation uh, for both youth and adults, that getting a youth, uh, a, a, a young person to quit is technically a lot easier in that they have a lower level of addiction because just because of the many years that they have been, that they have used it. You know, when we find that for adults, you know, they started at that age, 11, 12, 13, 14, and now on age 20, 30, 40, they now have such stronger behavioral addictions, biological addictions to that nicotine. So it makes sense to spend the dollars in trying to help prevent, uh, prevent, you know, overall from starting, but also those youth who are in the experimental phase, you know, who, who, who might be a little bit more susceptible to, to quitting that it's not it hasn't become part of their full identity the way that it does for an adult who has to do this you know 20 times a day it has to you know everybody around them knows so you're right Valerie I think that that's a a, a really great investment of dollars is working on on youth um, prevention and cessation so uh, and son I, I one of those aspects of 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 you know working within the communities and working on prevention are the parents 
and we get a lot of questions about, you know, well, what can I do as a parent? You know, uh, I don't know what to do. They're getting them for their friends or well, these things. Um, are there any resources that we can provide for parents? Yeah, definitely. Um, but before I share that, Valerie, I think that analogy of going into schools and using the, well, do you want syphilis or gonorrhea is such a powerful analogy because I think a lot of the times when we use when people kind of view vaping or e-cigarettes as like healthier, they know it might be risky, but it, with the word healthy still being attached to it, I feel like it just doesn't make the same impact as what you're using. So I just want to say that's a very powerful analogy. Um, but yes, yeah, so in terms of uh, for parents, we have something called the Vape Talk, and it's a conversation guide for parents for parents, and it provides them with a simple roadmap to addressing the dangers of vaping and the, with their kids. And so, as we know, youth vaping rates have dramatically increased. And even though a growing number of youth are vaping, a lot of the times most parents don't think or believe that their kids are using e-cigarettes. And so because many parents assume that their kids are unaffected or not engaging, um, sorry, excuse me, or not engaging with their teens about the dangers that they face, um, parents oftentimes don't have proactive conversations with their kids about the dangers and the health effects and the risks. And so what the Vape Talk does is that parents are first able to really get the facts for themselves and learn what vaping is, um, its dangers, and what's behind the epidemic. And then the Vaping Conversation Guide helps parents maintain an open line of communication with their kids um, from the dangers of vaping and nicotine dependence. Um, and so the guide includes best practices for how to uh, um, have the most effective conversation with their kids on such a tricky subject like vaping and gives tips and suggestions for before when they start talking to the kids, um, while they start talking to, while they are talking to their kids, and then after the talk. Um, it's a really great resource for parents and can ultimately help or prevent youth um, to quit. Thank you for that. And I think that that a lot of times, you know, we I, when I worked at the University of Hawaii and we used to do a yearly survey of college students, uh, the number one health information, the one that they trusted the most was still their parents, you know, even with the Internet, even with, you know, then doctors where they went to the number one source of health information was their parents. And so but but unfortunately, both this happens with parents and doctors um, as well, that they say, well, they don't listen to me. They don't follow my advice. You know, and, and sure, that's that they're not going to follow probably people's advice to the letter. But we do have to trust that 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 children, young adults uh, are listening to their parents and also listening, you know, as Valerie mentioned in the social norms and what are the behaviors that are being taken out. I think what we know is that about 60% of children who grow up in tobacco using households are likely to start tobacco themselves. Uh, so if you wanna have a great prevention mechanism for your children is don't use tobacco, you know, for parents to not use tobacco. So Josh, I'll turn it back to you. So tell me a little bit about the specifics around the tax. Um, why do we need to, what's going on with the tax? Why do we need to tax uh, e-cigarettes more? Or what's, can you explain to me a little bit about that? Yeah, so essentially what we're trying to do with the taxation part of our policy priority um, is address the fact that there's no tobacco tax attached to e-cigarettes. Um, our bill would uh, tax electronic smoking devices and e-liquid, which includes the e-juice as well as products with e-liquid pre-filled cartridges or pod-based products. Um, taxing tobacco products um, and cigarettes is a proven strategy to reduce youth initiation and encourage those who smoke or use tobacco products to quit. Um, the proposed tax would be the same as other tobacco products, which is 70% of the wholesale price. Um, retail price of some e-liquids is offered as low as 99 cents per bottle. Um, so the idea here with the taxation um, is to raise the price, essentially, of these products, not only for, you know, just general parity and fairness, because these are tobacco-related products that do deserve to be classified under a tobacco tax, um, but also try and get these out of the hands of youth by making it too expensive for them to buy it, since youth are some of the most price-sensitive demographics when it comes to purchasing these products. Um, they're also seen as one of the most equitable strategies to reduce 
um, just smoking across the board, just in the way that they are able to get them out of the hands of most of the demographics that the tobacco industry tends to target, which is low-income communities. Um, that tobacco tax revenue generated will also um, help to be funded towards tobacco prevention and control programs, um, as we were talking about a little earlier, um, which complement and, and strengthen the effect of these tobacco policies in reducing smoking rates. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a general overview of what we're fighting for in terms of taxation. Yeah, thank you. And I think that that's, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit more of a wonky kind of a point, right? But what we know is that for every dollar that is increased, uh, that at least for combustible tobacco, what we know is that for every dollar that you raise a, a tobacco tax, it amounts to 1% less um, usage in the population. So that's an incredible amount of, of those response. Uh, we know the taxes work. And unfortunately for Hawaii, we have never been able to bring that parity that we have with tobacco, tobacco taxes and, and, and vaping products, which is an incredibly important um, aspect. Um, you know, and, and Valerie, you know, you're talking about the social norms that there are. I mean, is it, do you see it as cheaper to be able to use vaping than it is to use, than to use combustible tobacco? Like, is it easier for youth to be able to access uh, vaping products? Well, I don't know if uh, this is a youth perspective, but for me, when I talk to uh, adults my age, uh, you light a cigarette, you finish the cigarette. When you have a vape device, you can take a puff, you can go back to work, you can go back to what you were doing, or um, for the youth, a lot of them share. I had a student who told me he goes through five cartridges a day. That's like 10 packs of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. No adult I know can have time to puff on 10 packs of cigarettes. However, once we break it down and we start asking questions, we learned he went through five cartridges a day because they share. And I think that's what it is, is, you know, if you don't have the money, you ask, can I um, borrow a drag or whatnot or a puff or whatever their, their slang term is, or you can chip in and say, here's $2, here's $2, here's $2, and that one person can just buy the cartridge, refill, restock, or get the e-juice, and then they share. Uh, to me, I think that's just where a lot of the ease comes from, is it's so easy to share this product. And being that the cost is a lot cheaper than other types of dangerous products out there like alcohol or uh, meth or cocaine or even marijuana, that pulling together or pooling their money, that's not hard. And being able to do an activity with a friend, it, it kind of balances in your brain of, do I wanna be socially accepted in this circle of friends? Or do I want to be the outcast who says no? So do I eat my lunch that my mom gave me money for? Or do I save it for after school and jump in this pool with my friends? And so what I also wanted to add before with the question about um, addiction is, yes, nicotine is addictive. We, we know that science proves it. But that urge inside of a youth's mind of, that social pressure of fitting in, it diminishes a lot of our inhibitions because that is what's the priority while that prefrontal lobe of the brain is developing. What is your priority? Do you wanna fit in? Do you wanna be uh, recognized as part of this group? And is that important to you? Or is your health important where a lot of times, I'm sorry, but you do feel like I'm going to quit before that happens to me. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's that... the prevention part that we need to really push that it's not as easy as you think. Yeah, and I and I, I just wanted to add that, that I think that that's what's neat about the American Lung Association Not on Tobacco program is that it's conducted as a as a group class so that you're able to use the peer pressure, that you're able to use the peer support so that you feel, you know, maybe you're not gonna fit in with your, with your vaping friends for a little bit, but you have another support system so that you don't have to, you know, feel like, like you're ostracized from, from society. And, and so that the, 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 the uh, social aspect is not as strong, but we know from, from addiction, which I'm sure you all, I mean, all of the panel knows, but just for our audience, um, is that there's a three link chain tree chain link of addiction is obviously the biological, which the nicotine helps 
um, there is a behavioral, which is the action of actually, you know, putting something to your mouth and doing it repetitively. And then there's the social aspect. And each three of uh, those of those aspects um, are incredibly important to maintaining an addiction. And so if we just deal with one of them and not the other, uh, it is very possible that the addiction will continue or that it will resurface later on um, shortly after quitting. I wanna put a, uh, a final question to the three of you. Um, we'll go around the room. What is the one thing, you know, thinking about the youth vaping epidemic as we call it, what is the one thing from your point of view that you would like to see people do? Um, what, what is the one takeaway that you would like people to take away that includes an action that they can take? Um, Son, I'll start with you. I know it's not an easy one. <laughs> um, I would say if I had to pick one, it, if I had to pick one, I think I would say that getting more resources out there um, in every aspect of the community, whether it's school, healthcare system, or anything, um, the more resources that are out there and the more more people are looking for those resources and asking for the res those resources, um, the more it'll kind of help and empower youth to take the steps to quitting. Um, yeah. Uh, it sounds good to me. Uh, Valerie? Um, so the number one thing that I always start and end all my presentations with, whether it's for high school, middle school, elementary school, or even just PTSA or parents or a community, is to always talk to your kids about concerns that you have with them growing up. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's sexual behaviors or tobacco use, because once you open the door to making your child feel comfortable having difficult conversations that could you know last a lifetime that just being able to say hey mom I have a question about this or dad you know I, I was wondering because for me it has nothing really to do with society or uh, people are educating the child as long as the parents agree to what they expect for their family. So I always tell people, you know, you need to have this conversation for your family's expectations. Yes, some parents might be like, oh, well, if you vape, whatever, you know, at least it's not, you didn't get caught with cocaine. But some parents who do smoke, who do vape, they don't want their children to use these products because they understand the addiction and they understand how hard it is to quit and even if they can just have that conversation and not feel like guilty because they do the product but to share that information that can go a long way so I always encourage all families to have that conversation and I always let them know that every family is going to have different expectations and that's fine as long as you set your boundaries within your family and you follow through and then that can also open the door to having more difficult discussions later on in life, which could really bond the family. Wonderful. And Josh, what would you have to add? Yeah, um, I, I know how difficult um, it can be to have hope, I think, in the world of anti-tobacco advocacy um, and just this kind of work in general. Um, We've been fighting for these bills for a tobacco-free Hawaii relentlessly. And, you know, at least for me, it's been five years of poison pill amendments, last minute exemptions, backdoor committee deals, thousands and thousands of dollars getting poured into campaign donations by the industry. Um, like last year, for example, when our flavor bill passed with a number of different last minute amendments that would open the door for countless flavored products to stay on the market. Um, we had to go on live television and urge the governor to veto it. And, you know, I'm not going to lie or sugarcoat it. It sucked. It really did to see what was years of, of meeting with lawmakers um, doing this kind of community-based advocacy um, just disappear in a second um, because of a last minute change to our bill. But, you know, as I said earlier, this work isn't supposed to be easy. The fact that it's an uphill battle at all means that we're doing the right thing, that we're fighting powerful forces. 
And, you know, year by year through obstacle after obstacle, our coalition um, out, out here on an island in the middle of the Pacific has organized, has rallied, has fought hard, inching closer and closer to getting our policy priorities passed and trying to fight for a tobacco-free future. I've come to realize that tenacity backboned by hope is what will get us to that tobacco-free future. Whether we're trying to convince an industry-funded legislator, having hard conversations with our kids, or, or doing group cessations, um, group cessation work, you know, so why quit when we're just about to cross the finish line? Um, so I think the one thing that I will urge everyone on the call to keep on doing is to have hope. Um, at this time when it's really, really hard to do that, because that's exactly what'll get us that win. Well, I must say, I am definitely a lot more hopeful after hearing you speak than I was before. So thank you. you, you you're, you're definitely part, you're definitely part of, of um, firing us up. So thank you all to all three of you, Sun, Valerie, Josh. We really appreciate it. We come to the end of our of our time together. I can't tell you how much we're grateful to you, to Dr. Zuo for being with us today and being able to have this recorded as well so that it'd be useful to a lot of other people that were not able to join us today. Um, with that, we're gonna close up shop. I'm Pedro Haro, the Executive Director of the American Lung Association. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, at Hawaii Lung. Uh, and don't forget to visit uh, thevapetalk.org, which has resources for parents as to how to be able to have that conversation with their children. With that, I'll turn it over to Makamai, who will close us out with a few final announcements. Thank you, Pedro. I don't know how I can follow that. That's such a great closing. To our panel, uh, to our speakers that joined us today, thank you so much for that insightful information. I hope those that were on the call were able to take away some feedback or something that they can take back to their communities, to their families as well, and just keep on um, doing the work. And you know, hopefully one day we can have a tobacco-free Hawaii. Okay, I just want to remind folks, um, surveys will be sent out later today. Um, please complete them by next week, Monday, January 16th. Um, and certificates of attendance will be emailed out to folks the next week, Friday, January 20th. Um, have a great rest of your day. Mahalo, everybody, and look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. Thank you so much.